Hi, I'm Unruly Anime. The story begins as a guy nervously rides on a train. When he gets off, he begins to run frantically. <laughs> but he's found by a group that somehow knows his secret. This group covers the area in smoke. And the man shows his insane fighting skills as he fends off several attackers. <laughs> The attackers launch several blades at the man, so he pulls out a blade of his own. To fight back, the attackers then use metal needles called senban, but this guy has crazy reflexes, catching them with his teeth and firing them back at the attackers. Unfortunately, this man is overwhelmed by their sheer number. He is captured when a contraption takes hold of his neck. And he's dragged by a terrifying looking man. This evil guy slams the man into the ground and uses his sword to finish him off. The attackers use a device to confirm that their target has been eliminated, and they leave. Elsewhere, a farmer named Joe enjoys life on the farm and eventually returns home to work on his motorcycle. He plays a game with his young son Kyle, who tries to sneak up on him, and he tells the kid that he has eyes on the back of his head. Joe's wife, Sarah, shows up, and she can't believe how dirty Joe's face has gotten. Kyle explains that his mask is like the ones that only Batman wears, but they are really bad people. Joe warns him that they might think that he is one of them, but Kyle is sure that his big, strong dad will fight them if they come after him. Joe playfully says that he isn't sure if he can win against these fictional characters, but Sarah states that she will take them out for Kyle. Joe jokingly says that he has to hurry up and finish fixing his motorcycle for when Sarah gets in over her head fighting. A news report details how the man from earlier lost his life, and Sarah seems concerned that it might actually have been the ninja. Kyle was certain that it was them, but it's time for this kid to go to bed. The kid says goodnight to his mother, and Joe reminds him that his birthday is coming up. With Kyle fast asleep, Joe diligently checks the security cameras he has around his house. Sarah is concerned because of how the man was eliminated. And what's even more bothersome is that no information was found about who he is. Joe tells her that there is nothing to worry about and assures her that no one will find them out in the middle of nowhere. Sarah is most concerned about someone called the Reaper. But Joe explains that this can't be him since he always worked alone. The next day, we get a glimpse of how cautious Joe is about hiding their identity as he wipes away their fingerprints from a door handle. The young family then goes on enjoying their peaceful life like normal, and Joe does his best to be a good father as he cheers up his son. One night, it was reported that another person lost their life at the hands of a mysterious organization. This marks one of several that have occurred recently, so a large-scale investigation is underway to find out what is happening. On Kyle's birthday, the loving family enjoys a nice kick out. They all joke around while they sing songs, and Kyle blows out the candles on his favorite type of birthday cake. Kyle opens a present to reveal a video game, and Joe gives him a new helmet as well. Joe prefers this one over the scary only mask, so Kyle declares that he's no longer a bad guy, he is now a hero. Sarah points out that she just likes seeing his normal face, and the entire family shares a warm embrace. They couldn't be happier, so they told each other how much they loved each other. That night, Joe gets up from bed, but he calmly tells his wife to stay there. Joe makes his way downstairs, where everything seems fine. Just then, something appeared in the window, and Joe was attacked. The attackers barge in, but Joe masterfully fights several of them off. His exceptional skill allows him to take one of their weapons, and he uses his sword to eliminate several of these men. While he's destroying one guy, Joe hears his son cry out to him. The alert Joe instantly springs into action. He blocks an attacker who tries to stop him, and he absolutely destroys this guy. Joe rushes to find his family as he reaches for something, but another attacker fires two metal needles right through his neck. The determined Joe refuses to let that stop him, so he crawls up the stairs. The crippling pain overwhelms him, and we see a mysterious figure outside. Joe eventually makes it to the second floor, where he finds that several attackers have been eliminated. However, Joe is then horrified when he sees Kyle and Sarah's lifeless bodies on the ground. Overwhelming shock fills Joe's body, and the evil-looking guy explains that Joe's wife put up a good fight. This monster sends his blade right through her neck, igniting Joe with blinding rage, but he is stabbed in the back. Joe drags the attacker as he tries to make his way to his family, but the damage to his body is too much to overcome. The attackers find that someone must have alerted the authorities, 
As police sirens can be heard in the distance, the leader confirms that Joe is no longer alive. So they leave just before the police arrive. The police arrive at the scene and are horrified to find the massacred family. Some time later, the seemingly no longer alive Joe regains consciousness. His first thoughts are memories of his lifeless family. And he vomits solely from the overwhelming emotion consuming his body. The next time Joe wakes up, he is in a hospital, and the nurse urgently calls for a doctor. Joe only says his wife's name, and he passes out again. Joe eventually wakes up, and a doctor explains that he miraculously came back to life after the coroner had already pronounced him dead. Joe couldn't care less and just wants to know about his wife and son. Unfortunately, he is told that they didn't make it. Outside, we see that two people have come to visit him. They are Mike and Emma, and they are from the FBI. They want help with their investigation. So they ask several questions about who the attacker might have been. Joe doesn't say a single word, but Mike can tell that he is getting very angry. This is probably the worst time to be asking him questions. So Mike just leaves his card. Mike tells Emma that it's just a hunch, but he believes that Joe knows who the attackers are. He decides that they will take turns watching him, and Emma is first up as she watches Joe on the roof. Joe has a memory of just moments ago, when he was taken to say goodbye to his family. The nurse found that he couldn't move Joe anymore, and it was because Joe put the brakes on the wheelchair. Joe shook with rage and couldn't bear to come any closer to his deceased family's bodies. Back on the roof, memories of his wife and son rush into his mind, and Joe begins to growl in anger. His rage reaches its boiling point, and he reaches for his wrist again, this time pulling out a metal needle. Joe pierces himself with it, and it does something strange to his body. Just then, Joe is attacked by several assassins. He is still filled with anger, so he goes berserk and expertly takes out several of the attackers. Joe shows overwhelming strength and precision as he somehow manages to take control of the fight. That isn't, although Joe does some kind of jutsu and turns his body into a black smoke. This move is incredibly powerful as it allows him to eliminate several assassins in one instant. Emma has no clue what's going on, but Joe doesn't help her find out and knocks her out instead. The enraged Joe then continues his relentless attack and goes on to tear several more attackers to pieces. There are a great number of them, and Joe strangely fires a sword at the elevator. We then see why he did this, as he uses a pole to defend himself and shoves all the remaining assassins into the elevator. Even though Joe is severely outnumbered, it becomes very clear that the assassins are trapped inside with him and not the other way around. Joe stands above all their corpses as he arrives at another floor, and he strikes fear into the hearts of any remaining opponents. Mike wonders why Emma isn't answering his call and is shocked when he finds several corpses. Joe finishes up nearby, and he is found by the assassin leader. Memories once again find their way into Joe's mind, so he attacks the leader with fury. This leader is obviously not like the others, as he defends himself well and even manages to put a contraption around Joe's neck. Joe quickly frees himself, but the fight continues to be evenly matched. Joe eventually uses his shadow skill again, and it allows him to land a devastating attack. Joe quickly follows this up with even more strikes, and the fight is over soon after. Joe demands to know how they found him and his family, and how they knew it was really him. The leader mockingly remarks that Joe can change his appearance as much as he wants, but he will never be able to escape his fate. Joe then shocks this guy and removes his disguise. Joe doesn't say a single word from here, and just ends the leader's life. Joe then goes to see his family. He can hardly bear to look, and he collapses to his knees. Afterwards, Joe returns home and drills a hole into a wall. He removes a box he had hidden, and we see that it contains several items, including a mask. Joe stares at a picture that once again floods his mind with memories of his family. We get one last look at his family home just before Joe sets it on fire. Joe watches as his once love-filled and peaceful life burns away, and he puts on the mask. The fire consumes every last memory, but we see that Joe is still filled with anger. Later, Joe recalls the horrifying moment when his family died. This time, his wife calls out to him by his real name, Hygen. His family no longer has him under disguise, and Joe's son screams out to him. Just then, Joe wakes up from the horrifying nightmare, and we see that he has tied up the assassin leader. Joe is in real bad shape and collapses. Joe is surprised to hear that someone has arrived, and this man is just as shocked as he thought the next time they would see each other would be in the afterlife. 
This man is a doctor, and he wonders why Joe isn't wearing his disguise. Joe reveals that the organization somehow found a way to see through the masking system they were using. The doctor wonders why Joe's body always gets beat up, but he then realizes why when he sees Joe's arm. Joe used the secret art of stark awareness, which explains what he did when he stabbed himself on the roof. The doctor tells Joe never to use it again since it will surely end his life next time. When he sees Joe's back, he tells him to forget about it next time since he should have died when he was stabbed. Joe has no clue why he was able to survive, and the doctor wonders if someone out there is keeping him alive. It will take six whole days for Joe to make a full recovery, but who just wants to get well enough to get answers out of his guests that he has all tied up. The doctor wonders what Joe plans to do after that, and his answer is simple. He will hunt down everyone responsible for the murder of his family. The doctor gives Joe something to help him recover, but it hurts a whole lot, and he passes out. After Joe recovers a bit, he goes to see the assassin leader. Joe doesn't say a single word, and just gets right to punching a blade into him. Joe stabs him several times, but the man reminds him that ninjas never crack. Joe shocks him when he points out that he already knows and just continues stabbing. Joe doesn't stop as days pass, and the assassin eventually tries to ask what Joe was trying to prove. He pleads with Joe to end his life already, but Joe just ignores him. Several more days pass, but Joe's not finished, and he keeps causing the guy pain. One day, Joe douses him in gasoline. The assassin starts talking really crazy and wishes Joe would have seen the look on his wife's face. The assassin was not impressed with Joe's son since he was just scared like everyone else. But Joe's wife was different. Her eyes were filled with anger and hatred until the very end. This psycho pushes even further and tells Joe that his wife cried more and more every time he plunged his sword into her. Joe calmly tells him to listen closely, and he explains that he's going to burn his family's eyes into his memory forever. He then goes on to describe the incredible pain he's going to make him feel. Joe tells him that he will never really have the sweet relief of death, as he will always have to tremble in fear of the only thing that lies beyond. Joe lights this guy on fire, and he just watches as the assassin screams in agony elsewhere. Mike has taken over the investigation regarding Joe Logan. It's an order from the higher-ups, as they are upset about what happened at the hospital. There were no cameras on the roof, and they don't know who the blood belongs to. Mike points out that Emma saw everything, but his boss suggests that he ask her again since she seems to have changed her story. Mike is furious with Emma for just giving up, but she laughs at how obvious it is that the higher-ups are trying to cover this up. Something shady is going on, and she knows that the best course of action is to just act obedient. In secret, though she has been investigating Logan and his family, she has discovered that they are all using aliases, and none of them actually exist. Back with Joe, he takes a look at the device that creates his disguise, and thinks back to how he was told that it would protect everyone. He then rides off on his motorcycle to begin his search, but finds that the first place he checks is empty. Joe would go on to travel long distances to check out other places, but all he ever found was disappointment. The last place he checks is empty as well, and his frustration begins to mount. That night, some corrupt cops enter a bar, and they get upset when the bartender doesn't give them enough money. Joe was sitting right there, and one cop thinks it would be a good idea to ask him if his motorcycle outside is stolen. Joe just ignores this guy, so the cop asks for his license. Joe ignores him again, so the cop tries to grab him, but Joe quickly knocks him out. Joe calmly just leaves, but the other cop tries to attack him from behind. Joe doesn't even touch the guy when he throws a punch, but the sheer force from Joe's swing sends the cop flying outside. Joe takes a look at their cop car and is reminded of the business card that Mike gave him. The next day, Mike thinks Emma's just messing around, but she points out that she is investigating a crime. Many criminal deals are being done in virtual reality now, and she has to get this job done so they can have time to investigate Joe. Emma then explains that advancements in VR have exploded like crazy recently, and it's all thanks to the Arza company. Just then, Mike is shocked when he receives a call from Joe. He gently gets Emma off of VR and signals for her to track the call. Mike tries to get Joe to tell him who he really is, but Joe has questions of his own. Joe wants to talk, so Mike points out that they are talking, but this just makes Joe break his phone. Joe calls Mike back to give him one more chance, but warns him to stop messing around. Joe lets them decide where they should meet, so Mike chooses a restaurant. The call ends, but Emma's disappointed as she failed to track Joe. As Joe makes his way to the restaurant, we see the ads for Aza everywhere. The ads claim that Aza technology protects everyone, and it's so important that people need to have it in every aspect of their lives throughout the entirety of their lives. Joe arrives near the restaurant and scopes it out. As Mike gets to the restaurant, he tells the owner to take a walk. 
The owner begrudgingly agrees to leave, but tells Mike to direct any delivery guys that show up to the table by the door. Since that will be where the food orders are, Joe finally arrives, but Mike wants to see his face so he can confirm that it's really him. Joe shows him the business card he gave him instead, but that isn't good enough for Mike. Joe decides to just leave, but Mike agrees to speak with him. Joe just wants to know who's responsible for the serial murders that have been happening recently, and he agrees to answer any questions Mike has in return. Mike is glad to hear that, but this crazy cop then pulls out his gun. He reveals that he isn't the type to make deals with suspects and tells Joe to get on his knees. Just then, a delivery guy comes in and picks up one of the orders. Mike wonders why Joe didn't use that moment to run away, but Joe still wants to talk. Just then, another delivery guy picks up another order. Mike tells Joe not to try anything as he cautiously makes his way around the table, and he declares that Joe is under arrest. Joe doesn't move an inch, but Mike gets annoyed when a third delivery guy comes into the restaurant. Mike gets confused when he notices that there are no more orders that need to be picked up, and this delivery guy goes in for an attack. Joe quickly springs into action to stop the strike, but his face gets exposed, and Mike wonders who he is. Joe finds himself in a fight, but it's clear that this attacker is no delivery guy. Mike tries to arrest them both, but he must open fire when the fake delivery guy goes to attack him. Joe has to save him from being killed, and the fight intensifies when the attack reveals that he has another set of arms. Joe gets pushed back, but he uses his shadow jujutsu thing to bring forth four arms and two heads. The intense battle continues, but Joe simply has more arms than this guy now, and he takes hold of him. Joe pushes him back and prepares to end the fight, but he realizes that the guy's extra set of arms was actually a whole other person that was just hiding in his back. The second guy attacks him from behind, and Joe does his best to fight against these two deadly opponents. Joe then once again saves Mike and tosses some alcohol at the assassins. Joe sets his swords ablaze, and the dangerous fight rages on. Joe eventually chugs some of the alcohol and uses it to shoot a fireball at his opponents. He takes this opportunity to launch all his blades at them, pinning one guy and absolutely destroying the other. The insane fight is over, so stun Mike, please, for Joe to tell him who he is. Joe just says the word pecking duck, but Mike gets upset since that is just one of the items on the restaurant's menu. Mike wants to know where the guy from the hospital is, so Joe uses the device to show him his disguise. Joe reveals that he is a ninja. These fake delivery guys were as well, and so were the guys at the hospital. Just then, the two of them have to take cover as the group shoots at them from outside. Things get even worse when they look outside, as one of the attackers fires a rocket at them. The entire place explodes, and the attackers take off. Joe is nowhere to be found, but we see that he's up above watching Mike. Mike looks at his chest to see that the ninja's blade cut right through his body armor. The blade doesn't even have a single scratch on it, even after the entire fight with Joe. So Mike wonders who could have made such a crazy weapon. Just then, the ad for Orza pops up behind him, and both guys stare at it as it makes its pitch for why everyone needs Orza technology in their lives. Elsewhere, a man named Zai informs his master that their target is unfortunately still alive. The master is upset by this and says Huygen's name. Elsewhere, a politician makes his escape as his home was just attacked. He begs for God to stop the demons, but things get terrifying when he begins to hear something. Just then, a few terrifying hands come out of nowhere and end their lives. The man responsible watches nearby and seems to take a strange liking to Joe, whom he has a picture of on his phone. Afterwards, this guy is visited by Master Yomaji. He complains that this last job was extremely boring and declares that his talent should be reserved for more exciting missions. Yomaji reminds him that he is simply a sword, and weapons like his have no will of their own. Yomaji then states that exiles like Higan are no longer considered ninjas. They are treated as enemies the moment they leave. They must be eliminated immediately, as they can't afford to have anyone find out about their secret arts. Higan is one of the most elite ninjas in the entire history of Japan. He has mastered countless fighting techniques and is completely ruthless when it comes to eliminating his targets. They already killed him once, but they believe that he was able to survive because he used his secret art. Yomaji wants to eliminate him for good this time, as he wants to find a way to uncover Higan's technique. Yomaji has already ordered preparations for this, but the other guy's more concerned with the one known as the Reaper. Elsewhere, a man in red is disappointed to see that someone named Zai has forgotten everything he taught him about fighting with pride. What he does now is just violence, so the man wonders how many of his former comrades he has killed now. Sai is eliminating the ones exiled from the corrupt organization, but this guy brings up how they failed to kill Higan. 
Hegan proved that those who have faith in the old ways will not fall for people like Sai. The man in red is sure that once the other exiles find out about that, they will stand against the organization just like he is. The man in red was the one that taught Sai how to wield a blade, but now he must put an end to what he started. He unleashes an insanely powerful strike and tells Sai that it's impossible to defend against a blade of wind. This is his secret art, called the flying swallow. Sai is still alive, but the man is sure that won't be the case for much longer. He plans to use the attack again, but he realizes that Sai's sword is missing. A look at his chest reveals that Sai somehow managed to stab him, and he is defeated. He is prepared to go to the pits of hell, where he will wait for Zai to come. Back with the other guys, Yomaji reveals that he has forbidden the Reaper from engaging with Hygen. At the police station, Mike is told that the attack at the restaurant was just the Mafia. Mike is furious at how obvious the cover-up is, and he is called by his boss. Mike is reminded that he will be retiring soon. So it's recommended that he not mess it up by sticking his nose where it doesn't belong. His boss wants him to stay home until his retirement day, and he leaves Mike with some papers. Elsewhere, Joe is at a hideout and starts a fire. He's once again haunted by the memories of his family, so he must take a moment to calm himself down. Mike arrives to meet him just as planned, but he points out that the restaurant owner was framed. He wants to do something about that later, but for now they will enjoy some pecking duck. Inside, they go over what they know so far. The blades used in the attack were made of a special alloy, and the patent on that alloy is held by Orsa. There is clearly a connection between them and the ninja, but Mike still needs to do more digging to find out more. Orsa is a very dangerous company, and as they have the FBI in their back pocket, Joe couldn't care less about how dangerous they are. They killed his family, so he declares that he will now hunt down every last one of them and make them pay. Mike reminds him that he will have to arrest him if he does that, but he decides that there are a lot of other dirt bags that he needs to handcuff first. Mike isn't ready to retire just yet, so he burns the papers and makes a truce with Joe. Joe pours him a drink and explains that this is how alliances are formed. This is alcohol, since Joe just prefers drinking energy drinks. Mike is familiar with someone who knows a thing or two about Orza, so they go to meet with Emma. Mike teases her for her piece of junk car, but she's quick to point out that his car is even worse. Joe proves to be a serious car enthusiast, as he knows everything about her beetle, but he's shocked to hear that she knows he is a ninja. Mike explains that he can trust her, but he must quiet her down when she starts talking too much. Emma has them squeezed into her tiny car and shows off all the tech she has installed in it. It's practically a giant moving computer that she built all by herself. Her research has revealed that Orsa is a multinational company involved in the development of military weapons. That's not all, as it also has a hand in entertainment, clean energy, and pretty much every technology that exists. It's like they are taking everything over, as their products are constantly replacing various software and hardware every day. Every country uses its technology to some extent, but that rapid growth has caused a lot of dark rumors to spread about them. Several people who were inconveniences to their company, like key figures, rival organizations, and journalists investigating them, have died in mysterious ways. The most recent person was the bold politician who died earlier in what they think was a car accident. He refused to allow foreign companies into his country, but the guy who has replaced him is doing the exact opposite. He's actively attracting foreign companies, and one of them is Orza. These deaths seem to be far too convenient for Orza, so she suspects that they are behind it all. Elsewhere, some scientists show their boss a remarkable reactor. It's performing even better than the last time they tested it, as it's now capable of producing 2 million kilowatts of power per second. The boss proclaims that this technology will change the world, and he declares that Orza must become the one and only company. Their technology will make everyone's lives better, and Orza will be the new standard for the entire world. Afterwards, he is met by Yomaji. Yomaji shows him a picture of the restaurant attack, and the man confirms that those were his men. He explains that he was just running a test for a new weapon, and he thought a ninja would be the perfect test subject because they have superhuman abilities. Fearing Yumeiji's rage, he points out that he targeted an ex-ninja, not one that belonged to the organization. He tries to remind Yumeiji that they are partners, but Yumeiji just tells him never to do that again. Elsewhere, Emma shows the guys the center of the huge enterprise known as Orza. Orza City is an experimental city run entirely by the organization. Just then, Joe keeps Mike from getting a blade through his skull as they come under attack. Emma tries to get them out of there, but a sword keeps piercing the car. Mike fires at whoever is on the roof, 
and Joe does some ninja stuff to sense where their attacker is. He sends his own sword through the roof, but the truck smashes right into them. Joe finds that the other two are unconscious, and he sees the attacker outside. This crazy ninja launches a ton of blades at him, so Joe goes out to fight this guy. He is wearing some kind of strange mask, and he gives Joe a run for his money as they make their way up a building. This guy manages to push Joe back a bit and shows that he has a bunch of mechanical arms with cameras at their tips. These things detect Joe as the enemy, and Joe finds himself in a tough spot. As he gets injured, Joe uses his shadow ability again to summon more arms of his own. The enemy takes a hold of him, but Joe manages to take advantage. Joe slices up some of this guy's missiles, but he has even more firepower hidden in his face. The insanely skilled Joe manages to dodge his missiles midair and ends up absolutely destroying this guy. A sword through his head isn't enough for Joe, so he takes the guy's camera and throws him off the roof. Joe knows that someone is watching and signals to them that they are next. An ambulance comes to get Mike and Emma, and Joe gets a phone call. He is hesitant to pick it up, but once he does, the voice on the other end explains that he is glad that they can finally talk. The voice calls him by his real name, and Joe is shocked. This person refuses to reveal who they are, but they know that Joe is planning to go to Orza City. He warns that the entire place is protected by a multi-layered security system and declares that it will be impossible for Joe to get past it alone. Of course Joe doesn't trust this guy, but he is shocked when the mystery person recites a ninja poem. The man explains that he's also an exiled ninja, and if Joe really wants to fulfill his objective, then he should wait for him. At a certain location at a hospital, Mike takes a look at a drawing that was drawn by his daughter. A look into the past shows that Mike was always busy with work, so he rarely had time to answer phone calls from his wife. One day, Mike answered because she was calling a lot, only to find that she had terrible news. Mike's daughter lost her life in a car accident, and his wife was completely distraught. Mike's unavailability made her realize that she could no longer handle being married to an FBI agent, so she left him. Now Mike can only stare at the drawing of his once happy family, but he's interrupted by Joe. Joe tells Mike about the person who wants to help him, but Mike is skeptical. Joe is, too, but the guy knew a poem that was only passed down in the old organization. Emma confirms that the guy was right about the city's terrifying security system, since her research has revealed that you would practically have to be a ghost to get past it. Mike fears that it might be a trap, but Joe simply says that he will kill everyone, trapping him if that's the case. This situation is even more difficult as Mike knows that his boss is watching him, so Emma thinks they should just quit trying to break in there. Instead, she has found a community on the dark web that has been keeping tabs on the Aza Corporation. They think Aza is building weapons of mass destruction as they are trying to take over the world. The site administrator is apparently one of Aza's former researchers, so Emma thinks they should go question this person. Mike doesn't want her to go, and he explains that a job like this is for old-timers with nothing left to lose. However, Emma refuses to let him go alone. They are on the verge of uncovering Oz's dark secrets, and the information they find might be worth millions. Joe begins to leave, but Mike wants to know if Joe's wife knew who he really was. Joe informs him that she did, since she was also a ninja. In order for them to be together, they had to break a code. There is a code that says ninjas must be emotionally detached, even from their allies. Mike realizes what kind of person Joe is, as this means he broke the code and chose his family. Elsewhere, Aza, Executive Joseph, is very impressed after hearing that Joe was able to survive the last attack. Even just one of the mass-produced units could destroy an entire army platoon, but they were no match for Joe. The assassin named Leal wonders if Joseph is going to get involved with the actual fighting, but Joseph is only interested in collecting data. Lil says, some pretty poverty stuff, so Joseph's bodyguard named Lily offers to shut him up. Joseph gets the meeting back on track by pointing out that Joe is headed to the city, but he's reminded that the security system is impenetrable. Joseph wants to hear Big D's opinion, but this guy is really vain. He only cares about his fate and warns that he will destroy anyone who tries to mess it up. Lil says some more puverted stuff, but Jumaji uses his power to silence him. He explains that they will learn what Joe's secret art is and eliminate him after Joe refuses to be bossed around by someone who's not his boss. But he does agree with the plan. Afterwards, Joseph reminds Lily that he teamed up with their group because it would help with his research. Right now, he's only concerned about getting data on his prototype, so he hopes that Joe doesn't die too quickly. Elsewhere, 
As I eagerly await his master to give him the order to eliminate Joe, the master refuses and explains that he will just send the others after him. Their deaths won't matter to the organization, and it's only a matter of time before their goal is achieved. A look into the past shows a trio of ninjas on a mission. We hear the ninja codes being recited, and the first is to never divulge the secrets of the ninja. The next one is that ninjas must be emotionally detached, and the third is that their missions must take precedence over their own lives. This trio of ninjas finished collecting the information they were after, and their mission is complete. Afterwards, a ritual is held in recognition of their trio's skill at Shinobi. It is a tradition, and they are all given names, Sai, Keegan, and Mary, this is. And although they are all shocked to hear that a secret art will be passed down to each of them, they must keep it a secret forever, and they all agree. The man in charge is sure that they will be the ones to leave their village in the future. And we see that Jumaji was there as well. Later that night, Joe points out that having names will now mean that they will always be able to remember each other. They decide to celebrate with a drink, but Joe reminds Sai not to accidentally reveal his secret art. Sai would never do that, and he declares that it can be a surprise if they ever end up fighting each other. Sai seems like a pretty cold guy, but he declares that the bonds they have made together are thicker than blood. They all then make a pact to risk their lives together to do what must be done. They all have a drink, but then share a laugh when Joe can't handle his alcohol. After that, the trio goes on another mission. Everything goes well at first, but Mary eventually hesitates when she sees a child, and she ends up getting shot. She is badly injured, so she tells Joe to just leave her behind. He decides to protect her instead and jumps out the window with her. Joe manages to resuscitate her, and he takes her to a nearby cave. Mary wants him to get away on his own, but he once again refuses. Mary tries to take her own life, but Joe stops her. She makes one last attempt to beg him to leave and reminds him of the code that says they must attach themselves even to allies. Joe's risk then goes off their charts as he states that from the moment he met her, he had already broken the code. Mary stands no chance of resisting his words, and they share a tender moment. Some time later, Zai manages to find them, and they are in bad shape. Back to the present, we see that things have changed quite a bit. As Zai no longer looks the same elsewhere, Mike gets a call from his boss. He informs Mike that he can do whatever he wants since he is not on a case. But things are different for Emma. Afterwards, Emma apologizes for not being able to go with Mike to see the admin. But he points out that he was trying to figure out how to get rid of her anyway. Elsewhere, Joe waits to meet with a mystery person, but the guy ends up calling instead. He explains that Aza City has its own technology everywhere, and that includes sensors along its entire perimeter. These sensors check to see if people have permission to enter the city, and if they don't, they are given a warning. If these people don't heed the warning, then the system will simply eliminate them. As if that weren't enough, the airspace above the city is fully covered by a barrier, and it only allows rain and wind to pass through it. Getting in above ground is impossible, so Joe will have to go below it. There is a facility used to manage the sensors, and the man sends Joe all the information he needs. The place is covered in security cameras and laser traps, but they also have mercenaries who patrol each section. It will be difficult, but the plan will only work if Joe avoids all combat. If Joe can make it past all that, he will eventually cross the barrier into the city. The man will shut off the power, but it will only last for five seconds. Any longer, and the alarm will sound. He reminds Joe that he will only have five seconds and that this will be his only chance. At a restaurant, Emma shows Mike what the admin looks like. His name is Jason, and she hopes that he hasn't changed his appearance. Mike says that he will be able to find the guy regardless, and he will teach Emma his little trick for doing so later. Emma won't be going with him, so she just asks him to be careful. She still has a lot to learn from him, and she just hopes that he will keep her under his wing. Mike eventually leaves, but we see how close they are as Emma reminds him of his daughter. In Aza City, the mystery person has shut down all the security cameras, giving Joe eight minutes to begin infiltrating. Joe heads underground, and the man instructs him on exactly when to move in order to avoid the mercenaries. Joe does exactly as he says, and uses his amazing athletic ability to avoid being found. The guy even tells Joe the patterns for when the lasers change, but they still put his physical abilities to the test. Just as he's about to clear the lasers, a tiny drip of his sweat touches one of them, and the alarm sounds. Joe can't turn back now, so he is forced to eliminate several mercenaries and move forward with the mission. Joe makes it to the barrier, and the man shuts it off. 
However, just then Joe is shocked, as he has pushed back and Zai is standing there. The two acknowledge each other by saying their ninja names, and the barrier turns back on. Joe tells Zai that Mary is dead, and he demands to know if the order to come after them came from Yomaji. Zai has no answer for him, and simply explains that those who try to cheat death still remain in its shadow. Zai proclaims that Joe will die, and he leaves. Mike arrives to meet the informant, but he's pretty skeptical of the chosen place. Emma points out that the top brass at the FBI are definitely watching them, so Mike should only contact her in emergencies. Mike enters a rundown arcade and meets with a guy named Jason. Elsewhere, Yomoji's informed of the break-in. The one named Oscar is still analyzing why the barrier went down, but she assumes that Joe had help on the inside. Lil just wants to take him down already, but Yomaji explains that it would be foolish to attack him now. Lil is a real psychopath, as he suggests that they just let Joe into the city. They have their entire force there, so Joe's secret art won't mean anything when he gets beat down by them. Oscar fears that the commotion will look bad for Orza, but Joseph actually likes the idea. They agree to lead him some way into the city, and Joseph can't wait to collect some data. Joe's inside man tells them that they have decided to let him into the city, but it's clearly a trap. They are deploying highly skilled ninjas to eliminate him, and the guy is sure that Joe will die if he tries to fight them. He suggests that Joe doesn't go, but Joe has already made up his mind. He will eliminate Yomaji and everyone else. This is why he came to the city in the first place, and he might never get another chance. The guy tells him to move at 7 o'clock since the city will be throwing a parade to cover up the fight that will take place. Back at the arcade, Mike tries to get some information, but Jason is more concerned about how he was found. Mike just ignores the guy and finds his hidden passageway. Inside the city, the parade begins, and we see that Joe is in the surveillance room. He makes his way into a tunnel as Joseph and the others watch him. Once Joe enters the tunnel, he is, of course, met by several deadly ninjas. Jason brings Mike to his secret room and tells him that he plans to take down the entire company. He holds a serious grudge against them since they practically forced him to leave the company. Mike wonders if this guy has some kind of personality problem, but Jason says that they were all just envious of him. Jason is digging up all their secrets to expose them, but no one believes him. Mike reveals that he believes the guy, and he wants to take them down just as badly. Jason is able to hack into their system, but he hasn't done it since. He fears what will happen to him if they find out. Mike assures him that he will be able to protect him and urges Jason to hack in there. Back in the city, Joe is in full assassin mode as he wipes out several ninjas. He uses his expertise to slice them all up and doesn't even take any damage at all. Joe even uses one nasty trick where he loads up a bunch of explosives into one of the ninja's mouths and blows the group to smithereens. The fireworks are doing well to cover up the fight, and we see that Zai is patiently waiting. Back with Mike, Jason has hacked into the Alza system but hasn't found anything unusual yet. Eventually, they find a list of social security numbers with prices on them. The file is called Bound, which seems to be the name of some corporate spy group. It looks like Orsa is buying fake identities so they can plant operatives. This proves that they are corrupt, but they still haven't found anything about ninjas. Just then, Mike is shocked to see Emma's name on the list, and he wonders what's going on. Alarms go off as Jason gets kicked out of the system, and he sees that they have company outside. They take cover as the arcade is infiltrated, and Mike cleverly distracts the intruders. They manage to get away, and Mike realizes that the FBI must have ratted him out. Jason is absolutely terrified, and Mike tells him that those guys were probably mercenaries hired by Orsa. Back in the city, Joe continues his assault as he makes his way into a building and wipes out several more opponents. Mike tries to contact Emma, but she oddly doesn't answer. Things get pretty bad as they are chased by the mercenaries, and Mike's junk car doesn't go very fast. Mike tries to fire back at the mercenaries, even though he is heavily outgunned, but he doesn't manage to do much. Jason is a lunatic, as he gets an idea and manages to get a bus to crash into one of their pursuers. Mike has him slam on the brakes, and he shows off his shop shooting skills by taking out two of the mercenaries. The car brake checks them, so Jason must take cover, and Mike fires at the last, mercenary. Joe makes his way through the building, and some of the final guards are terrified of him. Joe was a man on a mission, and his breathing gets heavy as his mind is overrun by memories of his family. On the top floor, 
Joe was met by Lil and some of the other assassins, who were impressed that he had made it this far. Joseph watches and eagerly awaits to see the results of this test. Joe looks at a helicopter and becomes furious when he realizes that Yomaji is watching. Joe screams out to him as rage takes over his body, and Joe rushes towards the helicopter. However, he is stopped by one of the assassins. Joe finds that his attacks don't do anything to them, and he ends up getting tossed around. Joe uses his jutsu, but Lil is unimpressed by the old and outdated ninja tricks. Joe manages to surprise him with some smoke bombs and shows that his only real target is Yomaji. Joe screams Yomaji's name like a man possessed as he launches himself towards the helicopter, but his grapple is severed. The fall does some serious damage as Joe's mask breaks. His mind still runs through memories of his family, and he ominously states that something will happen at any moment. Now the assassins make their approach, and Joe recalls how the doctor told him never to use his secret art ever again, as it would kill him next time. Joe has nothing left to lose as he prepares to remove the needle from his wrist, and he proclaims that he will be together with his family soon. Joe removes the needle once again and stabs himself with it. Joe's body spazzes out just like last time, and he takes a hit from one of the assassins. The assassins will throw him around once more, and Lil taunt him while he's in the air. However, this time Joe manages to stab one of them. He covers the area in smoke to conceal himself, but he is eventually spotted. Joe is able to maneuver himself in and out of the smoke, and he manages to stab another assassin. Joe's blinding speed allows him to dodge several attacks, including some kind of fireball, and he starts a terrifying incantation. However, before he can use the attack, Joe takes some serious damage from the pink assassin. Lil takes Joe for himself and rains punches down on him. The assassins continue to thrash him about, causing Joe to scream in pain, and Lil has already gotten bored by the fight. Just then, Lil stops the beating, as someone has appeared. It begins to rain, and Zai arrives to ask if Joe finally understands. He explains that the path to hell Joe was on is inescapable. Joe can still only think about getting revenge on Yomaji. He mindlessly attacks Sai, but only ends up getting tossed onto the ground. Joe just says Yomaji's name over and over again, so Zai prepares to take his life. Sai declares that everything ends now, and Joe doesn't say a word as he just prepares for death. Sai swings his blade, and everyone watches in absolute shock. Sai stares in disbelief as his attack is stopped by the pink assassin. The assassin placed devices on the others to shut them down, and they jumped off the roof of the building with Joe. This assassin detonates a bomb, and the massive explosion prevents Zay from following them. Yomoji's left to watch the failed attack, and Joe's eyes open to see that he is still alive. Elsewhere, we see that Mike is in bad shape, as he must be carried by Jason through the desert. Back with Joe, he is still falling from the building. His hand reaches towards the sky as if he were reaching for something, but he soon loses consciousness. The assassins look over the edge of the building to find that Joe is long gone. One of them wonders why the assassin betrayed them, but Lil couldn't care less, as he was just excited for the hunt. The next day, a seemingly average guy hears a message from Lil. His message is also heard by other assassins who blend in naturally with other members of society. Lil calls these assassins brave falcons, and he informs them that the treacherous crow has just flown from the nest. The crow deceived everyone and is now sheltering their greatest enemy, the tiger. Lil then issues an order to not let them leave the city. He wants them to find the two at all costs and tear their hearts out. Elsewhere, Joe wakes up, and his savior is revealed to be Emma. Emma is actually just one of her personas, and this isn't even her real face. When Joe came back to life at the hospital, she was instructed by the leader of the organization to uncover the truth behind his resurrection. They assumed that he had the ability to revive himself over and over again, so they wanted to understand his technique. Secret arts are only used in the heat of battle, so she had to observe him close up. This is why she pretended to be Emma from the FBI. This is her identity as a ninja of the organization, but she has another one. Joe was then shocked as she changed her voice to that of the mysterious man who was helping him break into the city. Her reason for helping Joe was so Joe could get his revenge. This is pretty unbelievable since she was observing Joe as Emma under orders from the organization, but she was also betraying the organization to help Joe. She reveals that she has her own goals, and she needs Joe to be alive in order to achieve them. 
She declares that the lieutenants he just fought are far too dangerous since they are equipped with very powerful suits. Joe's secret art will be useless against them, and he will die if he tries to fight them again. Emma reveals that there is still hope. She has brought a power that will be able to eliminate them, and she shows Joe another mask. Back with Yomaji, he is told about a suit that their traitors stole. It was still in development, and she seemed to have prepared for this betrayal far in advance. Yomaji isn't concerned about it at all, as he is sure that they will soon be captured. These suits are called Gusoko Gear. They are ultra-high-grade combat suits designed to work perfectly with all sorts of ninja techniques. They combine, and in just several years of history, with cutting-edge technology. Emma was part of the development team, so she reveals that the suit she stole is the most advanced of them all. All she has to do is finish it, and it will be like a whole new body for Joe. Emma has no answer for what will happen if the organization finds them first, but we see that they're having a hard time. Elsewhere, Mike regains consciousness, and Jason scolds Mike for having to protect him. Mike can't believe that he has been out cold for 10 whole days, but Jason assures him that they are safe. He brought them to an isolated house owned by some rich guy, and no one ever goes there. Mike looks on the bright side and points out that getting attacked means that they were close to uncovering some secrets. Back with Joe, Emma runs a test on the suit, but it fails. They need a power reactor that serves as the heart of the suit, but parts like that are only available at headquarters. Going there would mean certain death, so that only leaves one option that she isn't looking forward to. Joe is still haunted by memories of that terrible day, and we take a look back to when he was with Mary. She bandaged Joe up and told him about her ninja philosophy. She believed that having the willpower to manage one's emotions when they're at their most extreme would make them invincible. Joe manages to use this memory to calm himself down, but we see that the organization is closing in on their location. They have one last place to check, so Big D requests to go since he has a good feeling about it. Back at the hideout, Emma finishes up with the reactor in the armor plating, and she just has a bit more to do. A while later, she reveals that she is done, and this suit will now be called Kamli. It's a prototype model built from scratch, and it is meant to achieve the highest level of combat potential. It's an entirely new design, so it works much differently than the other suits. Simply wearing it won't be enough to tap into its power, and the suit has to be linked to the user's brain. The suit reacts the instant the user just thinks of using it, so its reaction time is unlike anything ever seen before. Furthermore, the more intensely the user visualizes their own actions, the faster and stronger the suit will execute them. The only catch is that sinking the user's brain is quite an ordeal. Joe will be put into a deep sleep, and he won't be able to wake up even if he were stabbed in the heart. Emma assures him that the next time he dies, it will be his last, and she reveals another secret. She was there the night his family was attacked, and she used her secret technique to save his life. She was the one that pierced his neck with the needles, and they froze all his cells by using a special pathway. However, once those pathways close, they can never be used again. Joe becomes furious and demands to know why she saved him instead of saving his family. Joe would have gladly died if it meant saving them. He's getting a bit too hostile, so Emma puts him down with some devices. Just then, alarms sound as the organization makes its approach. Big D begins to break in, and Emma starts to panic. But Big D finds that there's only a bomb inside the room. He commends the clever girl for this little move. Just as the bomb explodes, Emma had set up a dummy to trick them, but things get bad as Lil finds them. Emma is shocked, and he reveals that not being able to find them meant that they had to be constantly moving. Unfortunately, every movement in the city is tracked, and he was able to narrow their location down to one vehicle. Lil keeps talking, but Emma is more concerned to see that Joe's sync rate is only at 10%. Emma takes drastic measures to get Lil off the truck, and she emerges wearing her suit. Lil has always dreamt of fighting another suit, and the two of them prepare to battle. Back with Mike, he determines that they need to track down everyone on the list they found, but Jason needs a computer to do that. Mike thinks about how Emma would know where to find one, and he remembers that her car is practically a computer on wheels. Back with Emma, we see that her intense battle against Lil has begun. Lil takes command of the fight, but Emma declares that trash like him could never be a true ninja. She uses all her robot arms and takes control of several autonomous semi-trucks. 
Lil manages to stop them, and she reveals that she knows that Lil didn't tell anyone about him coming there. Lil doesn't actually care about the organization. He just wants to fight. He only wants to fight in battles to the death. So that is why he became a ninja. Emma is completely annoyed by him, but this just excites him even more. Jess and Lil see that several Emmas have appeared, but he knows that she just took control of his optics. Emma manages to stab him a few times, but Lil clearly has something planned. Something seems to be ready. So Lil unleashes a huge attack that wipes away all of Emma's clones. Emma tries to get to the machine that seems to be recharging them, but Lil stops her. Lil manages to recharge himself, but the machine Emma's going to use is destroyed. She is horrified as her suit has no power left, and Lil begins to taunt her. He mocks her for thinking she could win against him and rains punches down on her. She knows she can't give up yet since there is still a lot of time left before Joe finishes sinking with the suit. Emma left a recording inside Joe's consciousness, and it begins to play. As Emma gets beat down, the recording explains that she might already be dead. It also reveals that Mary once saved her life, and ever since then, they have secretly stayed in touch. On the night of the attack, Emma rushed to the house to save them, but she was too late. Joe was the only one she could save, so she apologizes for what happened. Mary always wished for Joe to live on, so Emma was just trying to make Mary's wish come true. Emma has done all she can, and she says goodbye to Joe. Just then, the raging fire within Joe forces the sink to finish sooner than expected, and the entire city loses energy. Joe remembers the words Mary told him about keeping emotions in check, and everyone watches, waiting to see what will happen. Just then, Joe's suit lights up from within the darkness. Everyone watches in anticipation, and Lil begins to taunt Joe. He knew that Joe would be the one to give him a challenge, and he gets proven right when Joe crushes him. Lil just lays there as Joe approaches, and Joe brings out his weapons. Lil buys himself some time, and he pushes Joe back, and they begin to fight. Lil gets really excited and proclaims that he can feel Joe's rage and thirst for blood. Lil decides to match his intensity, so he uses a powerful attack. Joe is amazingly able to dodge this barrage of projectiles, shocking Lil, and Joe remembers what Emma told him, the more intensely that he visualizes his own actions, the faster and stronger the suit will execute them. Joe uses this fact to move at an ultra-fast speed, and he dodges Lil's attack. Lil has had enough, so he launches a huge fireball at Joe, but Joe is a powerful monster now, and he just dives right through the flames. He pushes Lil through several walls, and Lil concedes that he couldn't do anything against Joe. Lil can now see what a real ninja looks like, and he exclaims that he doesn't regret anything. He feels completely content, but shockingly decides that they should leave this world together. Emma arrives in that moment and watches as Lil blows them both away. Joe is completely unharmed, and he declares that Little's death will be anything but quick and painless. Joe will have no mercy on him, and Lil calls him a vicious, nasty monster. Some time later, Dilai explains that they received Little severed head as a warning from Joe. Joseph is completely amazed by Joe, as he points out that Joe was able to handle the suit perfectly on his first try. Joseph wants to analyze him, so he suggests that they try to make a deal, but that's out of the question. Yomaji decides that he will have to speed up his plan since all that matters is his cause. Joseph watches him leave and declares that his words were spoken like a true ninja. Back with our protagonist, Emma assures him that they should be safer now. The suit-wearing lieutenants are regarded as having the ultimate power within the organization. Joe just wiped the floor with one of them, so they will probably wait to fight him again until they have a surefire way to eliminate him. We then watch as Yomaji speaks with Zay. Zai vows to carry out any mission that Yomaji wants him to, so Yomaji decides that he will no longer hold Zai back. He allows Zai to go and end Joe's life, and he declares that Joe will die by his hand. Back in the truck, Emma notices that Joe is staring at her, so she explains that she refuses to date married guys. She has it all wrong, as Joe just wants to know what kind of relationship she had with Mary. Emma explains that she wouldn't be who she is today if it weren't for Mary, as Mary was her savior. A look into the past shows the disguised Emma eliminating a target. She was shocked when someone put a blade around her neck, and this turned out to be Mary. Mary was impressed with her work, so she made Emma her partner. Mary was the first mentor Emma ever had, 
and she admired her because Mary always completed her mission without fail. To her, Mary was the ideal ninja. At the time, Sai and Mary were known as the best ninjas, and everyone was convinced that one of them would eventually inherit control of the organization. One day, Mary wondered why Emma always wore a mask. Emma explained that her face got all mashed up in an accident that left her horribly disfigured. Her parents couldn't even bear to look at her, so they just left her. She was completely alone until the day that she was adopted by the organization. The previous chief directly pointed out that she no longer had the face of a respectable human. However, that is also what will allow her to transform herself into anyone. Emma was inspired by these words, and the chief declared that she will now live the rest of her life as a ninja. She used this inspiration to become a master of disguise so that she could transform herself into whoever she pleased. After hearing this, Mary removed her mask and told her that she was beautiful. Emma didn't want her pity, but Mary explained that she is serious and Emma is the most beautiful person she has ever seen. Emma tells Joe how amazing Mary was since her words were so convincing. One day, Mary told Emma about how she grew up with Zai and Joe. The two guys always seem pretty intimidating to everyone, but she revealed that they're actually just immature boys. The two of them were very precious to her, but this worried Emma. Growing attached to people gives rise to emotion, and those feelings can end up distracting them on the battlefield. Emotions are what got Ninja killed, and that is why their code forbids such attachments. Some time later, Mary revealed her secret art to Emma. She was able to make it appear like someone had died by putting their body in a state of suspended animation. Emma was shocked when Mary decided that she wanted to teach it to her, and she pointed out that secret art should never be revealed to anyone under any circumstance. Mary had already made up her mind, since there would be a day when Emma would have to use it. Emma considers these days with Mary the happiest of her life, but they eventually ended very abruptly. Yomaji took over as chief and, for some reason, invited outsiders to join the organization. Yomaji would one day ask Emma what she thought Ninja's pride was, and she responded that it meant protecting the peace of Japan. He wondered what would happen if Japan disappeared, and if the ninja would follow it into non-existence. Eventually, the old chief passed away. Yomaji started changing the organization even more, but this was beginning to upset a lot of people. One night, Mary revealed to Emma that she had a baby growing inside of her. Emma was shocked, but she was even more stunned when Mary explained that it happened because she fell in love with someone. Mary decided that she no longer had a place in the organization, as she had broken the code. After that, Joe was amazed by her pregnancy, but he explained that being a ninja was the only way he knew how to live. He would have to learn to become a father, but he doubted that he could do it. Mary assured him that they would be fine since they would be parenting together. A while after that, Yomaji announced that the organization would be leaving Japan and would fall under the control of a great power. Everyone was upset, but he declared that anyone who opposed the decision would be branded into exile and eliminated. Protecting Japan is their pride, so a select few stood against Yomaji's decision. Two of them even tried to attack him, but Yomaji has a terrifying power that allows him to grab people from far away. He sliced up his opponents, and the crazy guy even stomped on one of their heads. Some wanted to take action against him, but this just caused the group to become divided. Yomaji declared that he was the true embodiment of a ninja, so the ninja will never die as long as he is alive. A group would eventually form with the goal of ending Yomaji's life, but one of the elder ninja explained that they would all likely lose their lives trying. Instead, he decided that they would flee the organization in the hopes of passing down their will. They would have to bear the disgrace of becoming fugitives, but that was their new resolve. Mary went to meet with this elder, and she revealed that she had created something that would allow them to change their faces. She gave it to the people planning to flee, and the elder wished her luck raising her child. Some time later, Emma confronted Mary. The previous chief gave her the top secret mission of determining whether or not the next candidate to be their leader was worthy. If they were unworthy, then she was instructed to eliminate them. Mary pointed out that the chief had been dead for a long time, and Emma explained that he gave her the mission a long time ago. Emma apologized for deceiving her, but she had to carry out the chief's wish. Mary then shocked her as she revealed that she knew the entire time. Emma begged her to just give up her child so she could return to the organization. Mary refused, so they fought, and she quickly realized that Emma had been hiding her real power this entire time. Sadly, 
Emma revealed that she couldn't even picture what her parents used to look like. And every time she tried, she just kept picturing Mary. The two had to keep fighting, and Emma eventually won. Emma knew better as she pointed out that Mary moved to protect her baby at the last moment. If she hadn't done that, then Mary would have won. Emma struggled to eliminate Mary. She always wanted to become a ninja, but the organization had changed so much. She couldn't bring herself to flee, since she wouldn't be able to bear the shame. Instead, she decided to unlive herself, but Mary stopped her. She explained that ninjas can't have emotions, so they have no family. Her baby gave her family, and it became her new reason to live. Mary declared that emotions don't kill ninjas, they give them life. Mary explained that she had always considered Emma family, and Emma teared up as she felt the same way. Emma decided to remain a member of the organization so that she could track what they were doing from the inside. Emma would always keep in contact with Mary, and she even informed her when she was sent on a mission to infiltrate the FBI. Mary always talked to her about the difficulties of raising a child, but she would never trade it for anything. To Emma, Mary always exemplified what it meant to be a ninja. Because of that, Emma decided to see her duty through to the very end. This allowed her to do some digging from the inside, and she has discovered what Yomaji is planning to do. They're running out of time to stop him, as Yomaji is already executing his master plan. I appreciate you viewing my anime recap, Unruly Family. Please let me know what you think about Ninja Camera by liking, sharing, subscribing, and leaving a comment.